Good morning. Um, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Stephen Dunbar Johnson, and as President International for the New York Times, it is my great honor to welcome you to our 13th luxury conference and our first under the International New York Times name. It's really great to see so many uh, familiar faces here this morning, uh, and so many new ones as well. Um, and I'm really very pleased that we are convening this conference here in Asia at a time when our circulation has just hit record levels. We have over 500 delegates here from 36 countries. And thanks to Susie's hard work, we have a terrific program and an array of speakers that is really spectacular, and I think the networking opportunities should be very rich. But the conversation and networking is not just confined to this room. This is a global event, and, we'll, and we will be encouraging debate and discussion over social networks. Uh, by the way, please do download the latest version of the conference app, which was updated, I believe, this morning to see the agenda, speakers, bios, and most importantly, to connect with your fellow delegates. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at INYT Luxury and join in the conversation using the hashtag INYT Lux. We are also reaching out across the world by live streaming the conference on INYTLuxury.com and we are joined online by many virtual delegates. And I would like to thank our sponsors for their support for this event. Um, and they, I think their names are going to come up behind me. Uh, we are very grateful for their generous support that has enabled us to bring this luxury conference to the fabulous city of Singapore. Actually, being here at the, uh, at the Capella, it feels like there's one foot um, in Bali and one foot in Singapore. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful place. And I think it's going to be great because it allows this networking to really take place. Now, coming to Singapore on a, on a regular basis for some 15 years or so, I've always been struck by the modernity, the order, and energy. And that starts from the moment one arrives at Changi Airport through to the ride downtown and the general ease of getting anywhere and doing business here. As Tom Friedman, our columnist, pointed out in a piece earlier this month, the contrast now between the functionality, modernity, and prosperity of Singapore, and the dysfunctionality, particularly of the political system in the US, and to some extent Europe, is increasingly stark. The future seems to be very much here in Southeast Asia. It is therefore perhaps not a surprise that global companies are increasingly looking at the Southeast Asian region as a zone of tremendous potential. And the opportunities for the luxury goods sector seem particularly rich. Now, I'm sure we're going to get into this um, in greater detail over the coming days, but let me just reel off a few stats just to, to make the point. The ASEAN re region has a combined population of well over 600 million. That's well over 600 million. The average age of the population is just 27. GDP growth for the ASEAN 10 as a whole is predicted to be at 5.5% uh, between now and 2017. The region attracted over $114 billion in for foreign direct investment in 2011. Um, and these figures are buttressed by a rapidly growing middle class and an ease of doing business that is a marked contrast to the experience of many companies in markets such as China and India. Now clearly there remains a very significant disparity within the region with Myanmar at one end of the scale and Singapore at the other. But it's easy to see why this region has become an intense focus for so many luxury companies looking to tap into the potential. A stroll down Orchard Road on any given Saturday, um, witnessing the sheer number of predominantly young people consuming and comparing that with Bond Street or the Champs Elysees was certainly enough anecdotal evidence to convince me. 
But I didn't really need convincing because Susie told me so. Susie has long understood the potential this region offers to the luxury market. She has been understanding and predicting trends for the last 25 years, and her track record of doing so is frankly spectacular and unerringly accurate. The reason why we took the conference to Southeast Asia this year is because of her. Um, her antenna rightly suggested that this is where the luxury focus should be. Now this year, ladies and gentlemen, marks 25 years of Susie's writing for us. Over that time, she has become the benchmark of fashion journalism and has deeply enriched our 126 year heritage of following and chronicling fashion trends. Now to celebrate her illustrious quarter of a century, we have produ produced this fabulous magazine, or what I call a bookazine, which contains a selection of more than 100 of Susie's classic articles. We've chosen the ones which we feel represent those moments when there is a sense that nothing will ever be the same again. The game changes that have left an enduring impression on the fashion world. The magazine will have a print run of just 1,000, and numbered copies will be distributed, distributed at tonight's gala party. So please do make sure you get a hold of a copy later on this evening. As you know, the International Herald Tribune became the International New York Times last month. We have ambitious plans to expand our journalism across all platforms with this move. Permit me now just to show a very short video that I think articulates this far better than I can. Now, Susie's appointment as international fashion editor of the International New York Times has come alongside a higher profile for fashion content on NewYorkTimes.com with more multimedia videos and in-depth quality coverage of fashion and style news from around the world. Fashion and lifestyle coverage have always been in our DNA, and as the International New York Times, that heritage of great fashion journalism will be further strengthened and Susie will bring her distinctive and authoritative voice to a wider global audience across print, mobile, and web platforms. In other words, Susie's journalism now has a broader reach than ever before with this move. So, we have a very interesting couple of days ahead of us, and so without further ado, I wish you all a great conference, and please give a very warm welcome to the great Susie Menkes. Thank you. No woman can come up without her handbag. <laughs> 
First of all, welcome everybody. We are so uh, pleased to welcome you here. And I want to say that I have a special spot in my heart for Singapore. I came here as a very young woman and I've been back many times. But this is not the reason that we're holding the conference here, although it's an added pleasure. I've learned a great deal about, since we at the International New York Times embarked on this ASEAN conference, Southeast Asia, as we've named it, an SEA, Sea of Luxury, as it became. We wanted to suggest that water lapping around these verdant tropical islands. Even if, here in Singapore and across the region, we are as likely to see high-rises as orchid plantations, there is still a similar rhythm to these very different countries. They have varied religions and individual histories, some with kings and queens and sultans, others still marked by the fading architecture of colonial rule. But the difference with China, which has been up to now the luxury industry's holy grail, is that the essence of Southeast Asia has not been wiped out by a cultural revolution. It's varied and vibrant. Those trying to sell to this region should appreciate the difference between, say, the one-time Dutch colony of Indonesia and Thailand, which never went under European colonial rule. Of course, in this whole area, you cannot ignore China. The influx of Chinese shoppers has changed the retail landscape right across the Asian area, and not least in this city. A visit to Marina Bay Sands with its casino and upscale mall is a must for those interested in Singapore and shopping and where this region stands today. For many luxury retailers, Chinese growth is still a template for expansion in Asia. So this seminar will be as dotted with, reverence, with references to China as the malls of Southeast Asia are with Chinese shoppers. Our speakers will also have something to say about the second and third tier Chinese cities in relation to Southeast Asia. Because of the SEA motif, we decided to divide this conference into six different waves. The first is a subject that anyone can see when they step into the malls on Singapore's Orchard Road, now under its blue Christmas lights, or whether you look at Jakarta's elegant men with their racy cars. We are talking about the power of the male consumer. At last year's conference on the promise of Africa, so many of, speak of our speakers remarked on the fashion fetishism of young men. Many of our delegates will remember then that Gildo Zenia, our first speaker at today's conference, had dared to open the first luxury store in Lagos, Nigeria. The fact that Zenia has been in Southeast Asia for a long time and that Tom Ford is opening a store here in Singapore next year is a testament to the hunger and the buying power of the well-dressed male. As for watches, there is no area in the world to match Asia. I'm told that male customers are exceptionally knowledgeable about quality and complications, and that in the city of Singapore, a fine watch marks the first sign to success. Intriguingly, a brand manager in Jakarta told me last week that 30% of the ever-rising male watch sales are to women who like their watches bold and highly visible. Going to a soiree in this city suggests that women are always eager also for the latest thing, whether it's in a watch or a bag or shoes or those ravishing jewels that sparkle at every social event. But as I travelled recently through Kuala Lumpur and Jakarta, I began to realise why accessories are so important and why brands whose core business is in leather goods, from Ferragamo through Louis Vuitton to Prada, dominate those competing in upscale mouths. When even Dior, which after all is a Paris couture house, has stores dedicated only to accessories, including elegant headscarves, that's significant, you realize that this is not an area where women's wear is on top of the to-buy list. We have a section on accessories that includes the exotic skin bags from London-based Ethan Co, who uses his family tannery here in Singapore. More of that later. 
We'll also talk to other top brands from Milan and Paris who are focused on accessories. Men, of course, also buy leather goods to go with their snappy clothes. But for women, there's an extra element, religion. In a country like Malaysia, where I believe that over 60% are of the Muslim faith, at a time when fundamental values are returning, accessories are the only products that can be guaranteed to be attractive to every single woman shopper. The return across a wide spectrum of Muslims of modesty dressing, which is what it's called, it's interesting to me as a fashion follower, if perhaps a troubling social trend to many Western women. But while in the Middle East, cover-ups are black and all-concealing, I've been talking in Kuala Lumpur to designers of joyous, multicolored dresses that have high necklines and long sleeves suited to the, the, the strand of society who cares about these things. Actually, there are two strands, really, I think, in Malaysia. It's um, visitors to the extended and rotating royal family and their events who are expected, the women are expected to wear long, covered-up clothes, and those, of course, whose religion demands a similar covering. Had we not arranged our summit in exactly the same week, I might have attended the Islam Fashion Festival, taking on as a, this week as a three-day event in Kuala Lumpur. And it's also an event that travels around the world from London and Paris to New York. The religious commitment requiring particular dress for women is something that extends right across the Muslim world, not just in Southeast Asia. And I would imagine that buyers in international department stores across the world are thinking not only of Chinese travelers, but also visitors with particular clothing needs and demands. What has impressed me most in these regions is the possibility of building high-quality brands in the spirit of each separate country. The designer Bian, whose elegant couture clothes are sold across East and West and on net a -porte, is a treasured example of Indonesia's delicate skills of embroidery with silken threads and the beautiful local pearls. With an extraordinary young, extraordinarily young population, especially judged beside an aging European demographic, there must be opportunities for so many more designers to emerge. But when is that breakthrough going to happen? When will the enormous stretch of Asia from greater China across the region become a provider rather than only a consumer of luxury? That is the question at the heart of this conference, and there aren't any quick and easy answers. I talked to the young designers who had taken part in last month's Jakarta Fashion Week. I couldn't be there because we were doing our changeover to the International New York Times. With a well-organized structure and a link with the British Fashion Council, the Jakarta Fashion Week people are primed to build a new generation which might be able to revitalize some of the skills of the Southeast Asia region. Those skills are really so wonderful, heart-stopping. I spent the morning in the National Textiles Museum in Kuala Lumpur, and I was mesmerized by the beauty of the fabrics, the extraordinary effects of batik and of ethnic jewels. The entire museum is a treasure trove of inspiration for any aspiring Asian designer. Now that fashion schools from London to San Francisco are filled with Asian students, more of that later this afternoon, there should, be a moment, there should be a movement towards a new kind of fashion fusion. But there aren't any easy answers for nurturing fashion creativity around the Pacific Rim, any more than anywhere else in this world of heritage brands and corporate clout, the big names that we see on, in, up in lights in front of every mall right across the region and across the world. Angelica Cheng, the editor whose hyper-successful Chinese Vogue has just celebrated its 100th issue, is going to help me this afternoon to monitor a variety of designers from local heroes to the ABCs. Do you know what they are? They are the American-born Chinese, the ones who are having such a tremendous success in New York's Fashion Week and in its fashion industry. We are going to discuss together the complex issue of Asian creati creativity. 
The rest of the waves will roll out on Friday, the second day of our conference. Of course, I'll talk more about this later, but we're going to, I'll give you a preview that we're going to talk about many different things, from Asian attitudes to addressing children, to the wider issues of e-commerce, creating emotion through digital media, and the value and importance given in this reason to jewellery. We will close the conference with a subject that's dear to the heart of all of us at the International New York Times, the importance of sustainability and good practice in the luxury world. We'll also discuss, among others, the ethical stand of Australia's Sasson Bride and the commitment of the <coughs> caring luxury group. You know, it seems even more apposite this year to follow these subjects around sustainability, which have been embedded in our seminars, our conferences for the last 13 years. Who could have imagined when we decided to discuss this Southeast Asian sea of luxury that the Philippines would have experienced such a climatic catastrophe? We do not know, of course, whether climate change and the way we've treated our planet was behind that giant typhoon. But we do all know that the greatest luxury of all in this world is not wealth, but good health. And the thoughts of all of us gathered here in Southeast Asia for this two-day seminar must be with those who are suffering in the Philippines. Thank you. Before I introduce the, our first speaker, um, we're going to put you in the mood for the, uh, this whole Southeast Asian experience um, by watching a video which is visually charming and you will realize it says everything about Southeast Asia. Zenia has expanded the Italian family brand, built vertically from mill to mall. He's created a worldwide benchmark for menswear, formal, casual, and sporty. Gildo, your company is an Asian tiger, but before I invite you up, I think you also want to show us a video to show up about your great company.
after that beautiful video, please Thank welcome Jill Dozenia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your Royal Highness, dear Susie, dear Stephen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm truly honored and pleased to be here today to open this meeting, and I heartily thank Susie for her kind invitation to this uh, important conference. Xenia has always been very close uh, to this area of the world, and I'm happy to have this opportunity to share with you some of our perspective on this market and on the luxury business ahead of us. For the ones who do not know the history too well, let me just spend two minutes to tell you where we come from. We are a, a more than 100-year company, born in 1910 in the uh, city of the Alpen Alps, Trivero. And it was my grandfather, I mean, uh, who really had the, the vision uh, to think branding and think uh, quality in textile, uh, try to emulate the best of British textile together with Italian design. But he was not only a, a good entrepreneur, he was a good philanthropist. And I think that today, uh, becoming uh, good people to the territory and to the people you work with is very important. He created Oji Zegna in the Italian mountain, and uh, today uh, my generation is very proud to continue this project uh, to take care of the environment. It was uh, my father and my uncle that took Zegna more international, that took Zegna from textile to, to ready to wear, so I'm very grateful to, that they opened the door to this immense new world of luxury. And I think it was my small contribution that uh, uh, made me uh, take the company in retail, uh, focusing on major market opportunities like the United States and China, and uh, make a bold decision to ask the designer, world known designer Stefano Pilato, to join us to make Xenia more stylish. Because I think that one of the aspects about this area is that style is very important. Why? Because you have a young customer that one style beside Italy uh, quality. So focusing now on the topic about this conference, uh, I believe that uh, um, Zegna has always been uh, an international company focusing uh, on uh, um, being at home anywhere in the world. And as a matter of fact, this 1994 campaign goes back when I was uh, a uh, young man shows, you know, uh, the astronaut, it means uh, uh, where the astronaut can take you. But it was a, a, a more recent campaign of fall, winter 2008 and summer uh, 2009 in which we used uh, the Indian culture and we used the first time the Chinese culture in order to show how much we believed in the local culture with our clothes and uh, uh, with our images. And this area has not always uh, uh, been important for us uh, in terms of market, but in terms of sourcing of product. You know that Zegna is a chain, is a, is a textile and clothing chain. And so, uh, like uh, every good restaurant that has a good kitchen, you have to get the best ingredients uh, for the uh, textile chain. So sourcing the best of materials uh, throughout the chain is very important. So I must say that uh, it was uh, uh, well back uh, in the 60s that we started sourcing the best of material from Australia in terms of superfine wool, uh, white cashmere from China. And uh, I think this uh, has brought us closer to this world, the world we are talking about. As a matter of fact, that uh, 1963 established the first Hermenegildo Zegna superfine wool trophy in Australia. And uh, last spring, we celebrated the 50th anniversary in Sydney, uh, inviting all the good, our good uh, Asian friends. And uh, we awarded the 50 award to uh, a sheep farmer with whom uh, we are very close with. So this tells you a little bit uh, uh, how uh, close uh, uh, we got to this world in the early stage. And as a matter of fact, it was back in 19, these are some of the trophies, it was back in the 1985, look how young I looked. I was in my late 20s, about the age of my son, with my uncle Aldo awarding the first Kashmir wool trophy to this Mongolian uh, uh, farmer in Uhot. 
And the award in those days was a Fiat Campagnola, a, 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 an Italian Jeep, because you know they, they, they had only horses to ride, and, and I think it was a good way uh, to, to, to bring to them a little bit of Made in Italy uh, beside uh, our fabrics. And I think that memorable trip in 1985 made me understand, I was not only in Mongolia, of course, I was in Beijing, Shanghai, made me understand the power uh, of, uh, of, of that country. And I must say that uh, we were bold enough in 1991 to open our first uh, store at the uh, uh, Beijing Palace Hotel, now is the peninsula. And I think we got lucky, you know, I think that an entrepreneur is half luck, half, half vision. Uh, so China helped both ways for us. And I think that this pioneering spirit really uh, helped us in, in, in moving forward and, and opening stores and become a, uh, an important, meaningful uh, luxury, not only men's brand in the region. Uh, I might say that uh, uh, from that region, we derive a very important part of our global sales. Uh, and I think that it helped us uh, also uh, becoming more meaningful in the rest of Asia uh, because Chinese travel the world and travel that area in particular. And beside uh, um, becoming meaningful in, uh, in, in, in um, the cities of China, we felt that uh, uh, early enough, we think we have been pioneer also in, in other countries like India, back in 2007. More recently, um, in Vietnam, I was just back from Hanoi and, and uh, Saigon a few, few days ago. So I think that it is an old world that it's opening uh, and our uh, pioneering Chinese experience is helping uh, to do that. So from this, let's say, uh, rather privileged position, at least in the men's uh, luxury field, I would like to share some of uh, the perspective, some of, of, of the things we have learned about, about the, this area, about this particular region. So I would say the first uh, point I'd like to make is that we must understand the demand of personal luxury today in Asia is light by China's customer. I think there is no question that this is the case. And this applies both in the homeland of China, including Hong Kong and Macau, and in Southeast Asia. Uh, and I think that uh, this is a fundamental factor we must recognize, uh, since uh, today we estimate that at least two-thirds, people say about 80% uh, of luxury business in this area is driven by Chinese customers. Of course, the area excludes Japan and Korea. The second important point is that the market is best understood and served, <coughs> excuse me, if we think in terms of cities. More in terms of cities, and I would say less in terms of country. That does not mean, <coughs> excuse me, this does not mean that we underestimate the value of national characters and national differentiation factor. However, cluster of cities like the Bangkok, the Jakarta, the Sydney, the Kuala Lumpur and the Hanoi, hopefully could become tomorrow the new mecca of luxury in the region, as many of the Chinese region have become. And I'm using a main slide that was shown in the Alta Gamma a few weeks ago, which I think is quite interesting. You know that the total lux business, first of consumption, is about uh, <coughs> 200. And uh, excuse me about that, but my cold is uh, <coughs> The total luxury business <coughs> is about uh, 217 billion euro, uh, the world basis. And it's interesting, this uh, analysis that Bain did on the major cities, in which you see the, that New York, Paris, and London are worth the luxury business of a country. Uh, for sake of language, Singapore is, uh, is about 6 billion. And there are no uh, yet uh, cities of this region over here. Uh, we encounter Hong Kong, we encounter uh, uh, Shanghai. Uh, so I do believe that some of the cities that we, we just mentioned could tomorrow be part of this slide and encounter the top 10 cities. But it shows, this, this shows the importance of cities versus uh, country. Today we approach, uh, uh, from our end, the Chinese market with a strong focus on cities, and we enjoy strong results. And as a matter of fact, uh, second and third Thai cities in China, cities like are big, cities like Chongqing, cities like Changsha, uh, Huan, Huhot, which is more a third Thai cities, today represents about one third of our uh, business uh, in Asia. First Thai cities, uh, mind you, we 
uh, consider um, uh, Chengdu a, a first high city because for us it's so big already. We have already three stores, so sometimes we sleep <laughs> one, one tier. Hong Kong and Macau represent another third, and the remaining one third is the head of Asia. So that shows you, I mean, how uh, interesting and balanced uh, uh, at least our distribution is. And I must say that the four largest cities in, city, uh, in China show a kind of saturation um, already. And uh, they must be ad adequately uh, managed more as a mature market, almost. Instead, second and third type cities are growing, and we believe we'll continue to do so. And they still leave room for extension of distribution. The overall front runners, of course, in terms of pace, in terms of size, are still the Hong Kong and Macau. They show uh, double digit growth, and that represents well a business that is bigger than some of European countries. However, we see that uh, in uh, most cities of Southeast Asia, domestic country represents uh, the majority of the consumption. Here I just put uh, uh, some, some data together of uh, how domestic score in, in this major market. I would say the one that uh, shows a, a penetration of the domestic market is Singapore, because Singapore is a, is a beautiful country for tourism. There are about 12 million visitors every year, uh, so it's no wonder that uh, it's less than 50%. But you see that the majority of this country, uh, domestic, are uh, quite important. And our investment in this market, uh, even though it hasn't shown yet a, 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 a payback, we believe it will show an interesting payback in the future. The third point I would like to make is that luxury uh, is a business strongly supported by traveling customers worldwide. I'm not saying anything new, but I think that uh, it's an important statement to make. And even some of the countries that Susie mentioned, and here is an interesting slide by Global Blue uh, Tax Free uh, Worldwide Shopping, shows that already in the map we start seeing Indonesia 4%, Thailand 3%, Malaysia 2%, so it's, it's nice. And if we go uh, uh, below, we start seeing Nigeria and Angola with 1%. So good news for Africa, since you had the conference last year in Africa. And so they, these customers appreciate uh, luxury, uh, travel, and, 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 and I think that we have to take good care of them when they travel abroad, uh, besides taking care of them at home. Fourth point. At least, our belief is that retail is the name of the game. I think that having direct control of your own stores is key. Why? Because it's the only way to achieve consistency of the brand. And I think that our asset, you can have all the mountains uh, or all the juice of, of, of the world, but the biggest asset is your brand. So you have to really make sure to keep your brand consistent throughout the world. Uh, in distribution in particular. And so we want to present this immaculate image of our stores uh, to, um, in order to give an exclusive service to our customer. And so uh, our conclusion is that we want to go long term 100% direct control. Today we are about 90%. We have still good partners we, 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 we work with and we try to, uh, try to make an effort to work even better together. And I think that uh, um, often uh, we derive uh, that we cannot go 100% in, in some market. Take the case of India, take the case of Vietnam. And so what do we do? We do a joint venture, but we want to keep a majority of the venture in order to uh, be uh, the best uh, uh, we can in, in the brand. And even Australia, that has been a, a, a country, uh, I remember, besides going to Mongolia, they were sending me for summer you know, in the farm to understand uh, the corners uh, of the finesse of wool. And I do remember that in those days, Australia was a total wholesale market. Today, we decided to turn Australia from wholesale to retail, um, which has not been an easy uh, job. Uh, but uh, we're going there, and now we have four stores. And I think that the network today in the region uh, shows quite a balanced uh, distribution. Uh, by which uh, we have uh, uh, 80 stores across uh, 30 cities in China. Most of the cities, as I said, are second, third, and fourth cities. Uh, we have 12 stores in Hong Kong and Macau, 16 in Southeast Asia, so we are getting there. 
six in Australia and New Zealand, don't forget the beautiful New Zealand, and five in India, which is a tough uh, market to do luxury, more for gold than uh, for actual luxury. And I think that uh, in order to do that, uh, knowledge of your customer, controlling the data of your customer, not for privileged information, just to do a better job to serve the customer is key. So I think we have quite sophisticated in having developed a scientific CRM, CRM, Customer Relationship Management database. We work with NPS, Net Promoter Score, uh, understanding uh, the tractor from promoter and correct the, the detractor and me moving them to promoter. Mystery shopping, we all know what mystery shopping is. And I think in, 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 in that do, in technology is key. I think there is uh, no future of luxury without technology, whether we like it or not. We were discussing with Susie, I think is, is, is key. And so we are uh, uh, not only technology to collect data that has to be meaningful, to be used uh, in that regard, to serve the customer better, but also to try to find an interaction between uh, the online world, which we are at the beginning, at least us, and the offline world, and uh, you know, work with this cross-channel held by uh, mobiles that will become really the key technological item for the customer to shop and to get data from. So I think that this is a world of really big investment that I do believe it will even be stronger here because the customer is younger. And the younger you are, the more technological you are. So I think this is an aspect that really we have to take into account very seriously. Fifth point, Susie talked about men. I mean, the power of men, I'm glad, because you know, usually men have seen uh, you know, second class versus women when we talk about luxury. But in this area, we are, we are doing pretty well. So whether we like it or not, men are still drivers of personal luxury good consumption in this area. They are surely are rapidly evolving. Personalization is key. Um, I would say casualization is another important word. Accessorization. So it's interesting how uh, men are, are, are getting uh, you know, their way of feminization. And so it's, 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 uh, they are learning uh, from each other. And, and, and it's interesting. But the luxury in this area, and in particular in China, also we talk about Russia, eh, started from, uh, surely from, from, from men. And what they do uh, really give importance, men in particular, is to the made in Italy and the fact of the inherent quality and craftsmanship of the Italian know-how, starting from, from the fabric, starting from the manuality. And two other important aspects that has a lot to do with family business, not only in Italy, but other world, is genuinity. They respect the authenticity of brand. They want to know history. And I think that the big challenge is to instruct our sales associate in the store to become ambassador and to tell the story. Because if they don't, they are dumb, because we don't take advantage of this incredible history that we, that, that, that we have, in particular, in Italy. Another good point, talking about personalization, is that we, uh, personalization helps to differentiate. I think customer wants to be uh, their own stylist. And believe it or not, we, we are offering today in our made-to-measure uh, made measure service, even made-to-measure fabrics. You can choose your own pattern. You can choose your own uh, design with your name written in the fabrics. It takes a little bit longer than a few weeks, but uh, I think that it's how far we go in personalization in the Xenia world. However, after having said that, there is one uh, thing that we have to watch uh, happening surely in China and it might happen in the area, which is a logo fatigue, which is something to watch. Because if it took uh, 20 years uh, to get um, this phenomenon in Japan, I think it's taking less than 10 years in China. And I, I think it's going to take even less in Southeast Asia. So we have to be careful not to become uh, logo driven because the customer wants uh, style and sophistication. And too much logo is not sophisticated enough. So one uh, uh, last aspect to consider about the region. We all, all love this hot weather, but uh, uh, you know, how much uh, warm clothes we can wear is about the climate. And we have uh, uh, been hit, you know, beginning by this climate, just delivering heavy, too much heavy product. So we learned our lesson. And what we did, we created seasonless collection 
we created a multi-delivery approach. And we are trying to uh, follow uh, the rule by now, where now. And I think that this is being well appreciated by our clientele. So that means it's, it's becoming very complicated to run the whole chain. But uh, I think that this is what we are um, quite good at, I mean, having this made it Zenia approach. Sixth and last point, which I already anticipated, but I think that is becoming, at least for us, a key style and authenticity. I think that they are becoming more and more pillar to the credibility of uh, uh, any brands. And I think that uh, our motto never to push logo uh, too much has helped us, uh, you know, sustaining up and downs. Uh, uh, we know that in China there is a correction taking place. And so the big ones uh, uh, gets a correction more than the small one. And, and I think you have to get used to this phenomenon. So I think that being able, I mean, to uh, balance and, and run this flexibility is uh, uh, very important. But not only authenticity, tell your true story is important, style uh, is, is very important. As we were saying, these young people expect innovation. Uh, we have uh, uh, visits uh, uh, um, in, uh, in, in China uh, of uh, um, our customers in our store that are two, three, four times the visits uh, that usually take place in Europe, uh, excluding, uh, of course, Chinese and Russian and America. And so you have to make sure that you show uh, new merchandise and new ideas uh, uh, on continuous basis. So I think that this uh, uh, important mix uh, of combining authenticity and heritage. Innovation and style, I think that is becoming key. Yesterday, it was key for women. Today, it's becoming key for men. And this is why I decided, with a very bold move, uh, uh, for my family at least, uh, to uh, ask Stefano Pilati, one of the world uh, best known designer, uh, one year ago to join us and become the head of style of Xenia and to become creative director in Yona. And surely, the competition has something to do with that. Um, talking about men's luxury, surely all the major luxury group are investing in men, seriously. Uh, you see their stores, uh, you see their product selection, you see their ad. So Xenia, that is leader in men's, uh, uh, you know, had to step up. And I think that this mold move to have Stefano with us uh, and already um, um, is showing, surely will help, will help us adding this style uh, beside the made in Italy and equality of our brand. So I would like to uh, um, show you uh, a little bit another uh, short video on uh, uh, the Pilati effect before uh, I draw the conclusion of my intervention. The sound of the show was in the feeling. And I think that was uh, you really, as usual, you got the right uh, message. So after this, uh, let me wrap up uh, my uh, four major points, at least uh, uh, for our experience in this area, uh, which are number one is that this is uh, a new frontier for luxury uh, because of its young and affluent population that travels very easily and loves to shop for innovative luxury brands. It will take some years, uh, I believe, uh, before we see population of potential customers in Southeast Asia of a size uh, comparable to that of second, third, and tomorrow for time cities. However, I'm optimistic, as Suni, Susie anticipated, about its growth potential. The second point 
is the present of significant travel flows uh, from China that generate demand in cities that represent travel destination and supporting the huge investment on luxury stores in Southeast Asia. They are very expensive, as expensive as in a more mature country. However, the strength of a brand in China is the foundation upon which can be built the expansion of the brand in this era. At least, this is our experience. Third point, style and authenticity will be the key values that leading customers will research in a luxury brand. Only those brands and companies that will be able to blend authenticity with style will deserve the loyalty of their best customer and gain new ones. And we all need new ones. Keep the loyal and get new ones. For the last point, only brands that are committed to invest heavily in direct distribution and marketing, and you need the pocket for that, throughout the region, will remain leader. These are the principles by which Hermenegildo Zegna is approaching this decision, and best of luck to all of us. Thank you for your attention. Gilda, just before you go, and before I rush off to order my jacket with Susie woven in it, <laughs> I'd just like to ask you one question, a clarification here. So, obviously, from your figures and from what you say, Southeast Asia at the moment is a very small player, all the countries involved, compared to China and even to the second and third tier cities of China. What is your view of the possibility of growing in Southeast Asia, meaning not just in the, country, in the cities that we know, but in cities we know less well? How long would you think it would take... It's a $1 billion question. Uh, <laughs> I think that, uh, mm, at least to tell you our experience, is first of all, master these uh, three or four uh, big cities and, and make sure to get your brand across and, and make sure, you know, uh, 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 to get as, as, as many aficionados as possible before going uh, in other cities. I, I, I can make you the example of India. Uh, maybe it's not so much in the country, but I think that we have been too quick. <laughs> to go to, to many cities outside Bombay and Delhi. It didn't work out. I mean, you know, I think we have to be. Uh, and so I don't want this to happen in other cases. We are not talking about the Japan and the Korea of the situation. So my belief is that do one step by step, master the major cities, become a, a brand, a, a well-known brand, and then move. And I think that having a local partner, it's helpful because it, it will tell you when to switch. So at least, uh, but hopes uh, is there and, and, and uh, not thanks to the traveler customer, but thanks to the local. There is a local to conquer uh, around the world and we see it from our database, London, Paris, New York. I mean, it's just uh, fantastic how, how they travel and, and how much uh, they enjoy coming back. So uh, loyalty is key factor. Loyalty on one side to uh, be able to uh, make them come back and get into new customer. And I think that the biggest advantage of this area is building a new customer base. I do believe that there is no future of retailing only on current customer. With the evolution of the population, with the evolution of taste, I mean, everything is, is, is moving so quickly that unless you plan ahead and seek new customer, I think there is no future for a brand. So I think that uh, the key uh, uh, to be here is because of new customer also. Gilda Zenia, thank you for your insight. Thank you very much.